Hello, I'm Jody Lane. I'm a professor at the University of Florida. We're at the ASC meetings in November of 2012, and I'm here to interview Joan Peter Celia for the Oral History Project. And just as an introduction to her, she is was my chair of my dissertation as long as well as many others, and she was very influential in my life, and I'm very happy to do this for her. She is one of the well, most well-known criminologists in the field. She worked at Rand, at Irvine, and is now currently Adelbert H. Sweet Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. She has earned her PhD in 1990 from the University of California, Irvine. She's won many awards for many organizations, including the ASC, the, National, um, the Academy of Experimental Criminology, and the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. She served as a consultant and on boards of many organizations, including the National Institute of Justice, the National Research Council, and she recently served as chair of Governor Schwarzenegger's Rehabilitation Strike Team in California. She's published over 100 articles and book chapters and 11 books. Throughout her career, she's one of, been one of the key scholars to improve criminal justice practice through her hands-on work with policymakers and practitioners, especially in corrections. She may be most famous for her National Institute of Justice five funded five-year experiment in the field with Susan Turner on intensive supervision probation. And she most recently is focused on issues relevant to re-entry, especially in California. So I'm going to start with questions on her history. Joan, how did you become a criminologist? Well, first let me uh, thank Jody for doing this, and I'm honored to be included. Um, how did I first become a criminologist? I went to Ohio State uh, planning to be a sociologist. And I just happened to be uh, in a class with Simon Dennett, who at the current time was um, president of the ASC. And he actually had heart trouble during our intro to criminology class. And as a TA, he asked, could I become more involved? He asked all the TAs that we had to really kind of take over in a much uh, more significant way. And so we did. I, I caught it, taught a couple of lectures for him in that large class, and then I was hooked. Um, he made the topic of criminology just come alive, and I knew that I wanted to be a criminologist rather than a sociologist after that. So why do you choose to focus your work on practical issues rather than more scholarly, theoretical, intensive sorts of things? Why are you out in the field? You know, I guess my, my interest in criminology was never academic. Um, I grew up, and I think we're all a, a product of our context, and when I was in graduate school, it was the Vietnam War. Um, people were out there protesting. I mean, it just seemed like, you know, the world was just going awry. Um, and so I think I grew up in a family that my mother was a nurse, my dad was an Air Force general, and it was all about giving up as we were growing up. And then when I went to college, it was all about kind of giving back. And I never wanted to be an academic for academics' sake, um, but I did think that academia could influence the world around me, and that's always motivated me. When I was in graduate school, I actually started volunteering at a women's halfway house, and so um, helping another graduate student do their research, I got very involved in corrections, um, probably at the age of 23 or 24 when I was getting my master's. Um, and it's been that love of kind of real world and, and research that I think has motivated me. And so were there any critical events? The halfway house, was that the main thing that said, this is really what I want to do? Were there other things that really said, this is absolutely what points me towards You know, I think working at the halfway house was kind of a watershed event for me because my job there was to pick people up from prison and transport them to the halfway house and um, then live at the halfway house for a couple of nights a week collecting data about their transition home. And I became quite fascinated about kind of that transition and how we take away people's liberty and the way in which we do or do not try to reintegrate them. And I think that that, that interest, if I think about I did that at 24 and here I am, you know, 40 years later still fascinated by the same topic, so I think that really did influence me. Was there anything in your personal life separate from academia or, or um, university work that put you towards this, or was it just your interest in the experience? You know, I don't have any, I wish I had some wonderful story about, you know, a family member who had been incarcerated or something, but no, I grew up very middle class. Um, and if I hadn't become a criminologist, I wanted to, you know, be a social worker. So I think that that was kind of the way I originally got into the field was just kind of this helping orientation. I think over time, you know, my work has become less of that. Um, but that was initially when I was young, just trying to figure out, you know, 
what difference I could make. What do you think are your most important contributions to the academic field? You know, I after graduate school, I um, was lucky enough to be hired as a research assistant at the RAND Corporation, and I had just had a master's. Um, they were thinking of starting a criminal justice program, and I was lucky enough to be hired as kind of this lowest level uh, research assistant. They said, you know, we're not sure if it's really going to work or not, and I remember they were going to pay me 11000 a year, and that seemed like a good deal to me at the time. <laughs> And so I went to work for Peter Greenwood, and together we, we founded and developed the criminal justice program. And I think that's what I'm most proud of. Um, the hallmark of what we were doing in those days was to work with agency personnel, first police, then district attorneys, then uh, corrections officials, to design real world experiments, to really test the ideas that they thought would work. And so I think experimentation, um, early experimentation, of doing large-scale field experiments is probably um, one I'm most proud of. What about specifically for the practitioner criminal justice field? Is there anything specifically that you're most proud of that you made a difference in? You know, I guess it's my whole body of work. Um, I think that, that probably for the last 30 years, if there's been one thing that I've tried is to, in every project, make sure that I'm not only at the table, but sitting around the table are practitioners. Um, I've never done a project that only involves academics. I think I would find that not particularly gratifying. You know, I want from start to finish those practitioners to tell me what's important, what they think works, um, and then I want to go out and test it with the most rigorous models I can. And then I want to get back to them. So I, I think it's that partnership um, that to me is what I'm, I'm probably most interested in. What would you like to be most remembered for? I think it is that. It is that, that, you know, you can have both. You can, have, you can be a very rigorous, experimental criminologist and do real world practical things. And I think we often think that it's one or the other, that you're either a kind of theoretical, rigorous, running fancy models and you belong in academics and you publish in only the best journals, or you work with practitioners and that's kind of always been seen as kind of a lower level activity. I think that the challenge is to make those two things marry one another. Rigorous and real world practitioner and that's what I guess I'd most like to be remembered for. Okay, and what have you been most praised for? You know, I think it is probably that, that um, when I've heard any compliments, if I ever get any, it is that I don't try to speak above the practitioner community. I think when they've invited me back, um, they know that I'm really paying attention. I think it's quite arrogant of us as academics and criminologists to think that we have the answers. I think they actually have the answers um, in many instances, and what we bring to the table is testing their gut intuition, and I think that's practitioners often tell me that, that they feel that from me. And I hope they do, because that, that would be what I would be most proud of. What have you been most criticized for? Probably it's along those same lines. I think some of my academic colleagues think that I get muddied, um, that I get uh, too into the real world, that perhaps my embeddedness clouds my judgment. Um, so I think if there were criticisms of my work, it is the same thing that I'm most proud of. Um, and I think both things are actually true. Um, I'm sure I do get influenced by those I work with, but I like that influence. I, I think that if we continue to conduct criminology in an ivory tower, we just publish and we don't affect the real world policies, and there's so much that needs to be affected. Um, to me, there's such a need. So I guess I'm criticized for muddying it up um, and not being as rigorous, maybe, as some of my colleagues when you hit the real world, but I guess I'm just kind of proud of that anyways. How have you responded when they criticized you? Kind of each of us have a role to, to play. This is my role. Um, I've been in the field long enough that I, I no longer take it personally. I think all things, um, if you want to be a theoretical criminologist, more power to you. And if you never want to work with the real world, more power to you. But for my career, um, that's just not what I'm about. Okay. Um, is there anything about your career that you would change if you could? Um, I don't think so. I actually think every 
prior period has led me to the later period. And so as, as my career, I've kind of had three different major jobs. Um, you know, I went to the Rand Corporation where I stayed 20 years, um, where there's only one product, which is working in policy analysis. I think there I got my love of policy analysis, but I never taught. And so then I went to UC Irvine. I loved trying to infuse students with that love of policy, and you're a great example of, of a student who, who took what I had to offer and maybe, maybe looked at their career a little differently. And so, um, you know, I had 20 great years of, of bringing that applied criminology to a wonderful, you know, criminology department, started a center there, which was modeled after the Rand Corporation work I did there. Um, my third career is now moving to a law school. Uh, and I've developed a center there, and I'm trying to bring that same policy analysis to now the study of law. And so to me, it's just been a fascinating and incredibly rewarding career. What are your thoughts about your impact on your mentees over the years? You know, I hear from, from many of them that, um, that at least I've, I've opened up an area uh, of something that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. I think my classes tended to be a little different than the regular academic criminology classes. I probably don't focus as much on theory as I should have, and I probably focus a whole lot more on practical implications. I always bring in to every class I teach uh, representatives of that world. So I bring in police chiefs, parole officials, ex-offenders, victims, um, to try to get the students to understand the real world applications of what we're studying. Um, I take them into to prisons. Um, you know, I, I just try to bring in that. And I think my people who've been in my classes, at least of course I have a selection bias, right? <laughs> I only hear from the ones who, who enjoyed that kind of focus, but I hear back at least for some of them that that was very meaningful. Okay, um, do you have any advice for young scholars in terms of building their own careers? You know, I think my advice would be to focus more. I think that young scholars, um, because of the internet, because of the easy access to data, because of the pressure to publish, um, I think they don't have the luxury of taking a topic and sticking with it. Um, I think you've got to pick a topic that you are just intellectually curious and fascinated about. I mean, I've, I've been in this field for now over 30 years, and I'm absolutely still as fascinated about the topic that I study sentencing and corrections as I was on day one. In fact, I actually am more excited about it than I was <laughs> on day one. Um, I've been always fascinated by what happens after conviction. So I'm not a prevention person. I'm not a you know policing person on the streets. I'm really particularly interested in when does government decide to take liberty away after conviction? How do we make those decisions? Who goes to prison? Who goes to jail? Who goes back to probation? Who goes back to families? What kind of social support? You know, and tracking those people beyond those dispositions, beyond uh, that particular disposition into their long-term criminal or non-criminal careers. So it's, it's a very narrow part of the criminal justice system to me, but having focused on just that kind of what happens after conviction, I mean, it's a big issue in some ways, but it's a small issue relative to the whole of criminology, but it's allowed me to, I think, be very specialized in that one area and to become an expert in that one area. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would advise young people to do is work locally, especially if you want to do the work that, that I do, which is interacting with practitioners. Locally, I mean, for example, for the last five to seven years, I've worked totally in California. In fact, most of my career has been doing studies of California. And I think that's really allowed me to up and down the state, you know, California's 10% of the U.S. population, and I've worked there for 30 years, that I can pretty much now walk into a police department or a DA's office or a probation or the prison system, and they will have known of my work in some capacity. And that gets me into circles I never would have previously. So my advice for young people is, is pick a pick a topic and pick a geography that you want to really invest in because the other advice is it's all about relationships. 
I mean, we learn this in our personal lives, but we fail to recognize its importance in our professional lives. Um, you know, it's, they're not going to be able to read everything you've written. You know, your reputation is going to precede you, and so if you have treated those practitioners well, they will open the door for you in the future. And I just think that, that I guess to some, it's, it's to me it's about focus. On it, you know, and not all over the place. Um, I just think people that don't get that early on lose a lot of benefit. What do you see as the future of the field? You know, I think it, it's going in two ways. Um, I think we're stronger than we've ever been. Uh, criminology continues to advance. Um, we have more journals, more participants. It's the, one of the fastest growing majors, both as undergraduate and in graduate studies. Um, and, and I think our methods are better, uh, I, think, I think if you want to study crime, we are the place. I mean, I love our interdisciplinary focus, I think we're, we're now bringing that to fruition, although we've talked about it in the field forever. Um, we now have people from all different kinds of backgrounds entering our field, coming to these meetings. And so I think we have the potential to really be a home of, of major policy and program innovation. I think the downside is, is the problem that I've, I've spoken about before is that our academic institutions often don't reward the kinds of things that I think allow us to really matter. Um, when you think the problems that we're dealing with, um, let's just take one. Crime was going down for the last 20 years and now there's suggestions that it's perhaps going up. Prison populations were going up in the last 20 years. Now they're coming down for the first time. Major issue that, you know, not just about criminologists, but what does it do to public safety? What does it do to state budgets? You know, we're in a huge economic recession. How can you marry the decline of prison populations with the uptick, perhaps, in, in crime, the downtick in budgets to fund programs? I mean, to me, the issues are more important than they've ever been, and there's no other home that should be looking that, except for the people that belong to criminology. Um, you know, so this, this kind of mismatch between our skill set and the need for what we have to offer, yet in the areas that most of us work, which is in academia, there's not a whole lot of rewards for going out and trying to create those bridges, and so I still think that's a huge, huge problem. Um, of, of how we make that better. What would you like your impact of your own work to be on future scholars, like down the road, decades later? You know, I guess I would just like, you know, when I'm no longer here anymore, that, that uh, people would have said, you know, gosh, well, she did her career that way. I mean, she clearly made it. I mean, she was on the fence between academia and public policy. She had a successful career. So maybe it's possible. Um, you know, I'd like to think that I could be a role model for students that are thinking that maybe they do want to do something that's impactful. Um, I get a sense, like me, that young criminologists are anxious to do something useful with their lives. I think everybody wants to have an impact. We want to find meaning. Um, and often feel kind of hamstrung in their current, especially as a young scholar, an assistant professor, how can I both publish so that I move through the academic tenure process and also, you know, work with practitioners, which involves a lot of meetings, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of uh, commission work that, that doesn't fit anywhere on a resume. And so I often feel that, that young people have the desire to do kind of what I did um, but aren't quite sure how to make it work in their own lives. And so I guess I'd like them to kind of look at my career and say, well, there, you know, she had that desire, she was frustrated, she kind of did it, and, and she had some success. What do you hope scholars will do in the future um, in the field of criminal justice practice and corrections? What do you hope their efforts will be and the difference that they will make? What do you hope the field's going to go toward? Well, I guess you know, we all, want, we all want people to reproduce our own careers, right? Because we found them interesting and they were so rewarding. After 35 years, I'd love for students to say, gosh, she's still excited about the field. After 35 years, there must have been something there that turned her on. And, and so I'd like, I'd like people to, again, understand that, that there's a huge need. I remember Elliot Curry once said, 
criminologists fiddle with equations while the cities burn. He wrote that in the 70s, and I read that, and I thought, that so speaks to me. How can I be sitting in a classroom, you know, when there's a world out there that needs the lessons I'm learning in these classes? You know, who gets involved in crime? Who gets arrested for crime? Who gets, you know, sentenced to in prison? What's the impact on the prison? These hugely important issues that I was learning about in class, and could I figure out some way to connect with judges and prosecutors that needed to know what I was learning. And so I think that, um, I just hope that, that young people figure out and other people figure out how to make those bridges. And I think the best way is to work locally and statewide um, because I think eventually those partnerships, this is the practical side of me, those partnerships will allow you to get grants. Those grants ultimately will be valued by your university, and those grants, in fact, will ultimately lead to publications. But you've got to do the homework. You've got to work on the ground, making those relationships. I think those partnerships um, have power that academics and universities, particularly that are hurting, will in fact recognize more. They certainly have in my own career. Um, when I can bring those partnerships into the university in terms of money, um, then I have, have something that everybody's uh, in favor of. So that's all the questions I have. Is there anything else you want to share with us? Well, you haven't mentioned a whole other area of my work, which has to do with um, offenders with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, that, I guess, is, is another lesson, I think, for young people, is, is to kind of go where your heart goes, too. Um, you'll get opportunities. This was one. It was when I was president of the ASC. I got a call from a senator. He was Senator De DeWine in Ohio. And he said, I'm calling um, because you're president of the ASC and we have uh, some legislative interest in looking at victims who are disabled, who are victimized by crime. And that was in the 1985, I got that call. He didn't know anything about me except that my name was on the letterhead of the ASC. And he said, is there any criminologist that is studying persons with developmental disabilities in the criminal justice system? And I said, you know, Senator, I don't know of any, but let me check. And, but I was, I was stuck, struck by the call because I have two children with disabilities, developmental disabilities. And I looked around, I remember hanging up and I thought, if not me, who? You know, there was nobody studying that topic. And I decided to take it on, I've published now four or five uh, reports on that area. I've looked at victims with disabilities. I've looked at offenders with disabilities. I then chaired a National Research Council uh, workshop on persons with developmental disabilities. I'm now the state's expert in the California prison system on implementation of the ADA within the prison system for persons with both physical and mental handicaps. That was an area I never planned to work in. But I think you've also kind of got to, got to jump on things that are, are um, you're called upon to do. And so it's not all going to be planned. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to kind of be a little bit haphazard uh, in some ways. But I also think that there are things we are called to do that we can't say no to. And that, that was one area um, that I continue to train law enforcement. I continue to talk to rape crisis centers, I've worked with physicians on how you take a rape statement for a person who's intellectually challenged. Um, so that's a whole other area of my work that I'm really very proud of. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.